Hello, everybody, and welcome to AARP and Vivo Contigo. We're celebrating Latino accomplishments and happenings in our communities across the nation and exploring how we are emerging stronger together. Today, we're talking about the connection between art, culture, community with local artists from the beautiful land of enchantment, New Mexico. To start, I want to introduce you to Dr. Pauline Rendoni, AARP New Mexico volunteer, to share a little bit about how she has helped foster community online during the pandemic. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Rendoni. I'm so excited. Uh, how are you? Everything good? Very good, thank you. And thank you for the introduction, Jesus. It's good meeting you. Oh, it's a real pleasure to meet you. I, I, I'm so excited to learn more about your journey. And I wanna ask a few questions. I wanna start off by, by asking you, how did you begin volunteering with ARP? Like what brought you into the organization initially? Actually, I had retired from my position at the New Mexico legislature which was an interesting position, but it was um, very busy all the time. And having been working in a busy place, I decided to start looking around for organizations to join. And uh, the director of advocacy um, asked me to come to a luncheon. And so I did, I attended that one luncheon. And then so I joined AARP, even though I had already joined some other organizations, but I have been active active with ARP since then. That's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you got involved with ARP. Super exciting stuff. And, and I have to ask, as, as an AARP volunteer, you saw an opportunity during the pandemic to launch an online program, Hidden Treasures. They look at New Mexico arts and culture to share stories of local art and artists. Can you tell us a little bit about this program and how it was launched? The program itself was only supposed to be a one-time uh, occurrence. Uh, I, um, I started to look around at the people that I knew and I thought, hidden treasures, a look at art and culture. And so I um, invited my guest who shared a lot of the New Mexico Highlands University collection artwork. And that went over really well. And from there, I ended up having a program every month since um, wow. January. Uh, our guest that we have today, she will be my guest, Julia Gomez, and she will present her craft and her artwork. So Pauline, this series has had thousands of views. What do you want people to learn about New Mexico's art and culture through this? New Mexico, um, our state is so beautiful to begin with. And then especially Santa Fe. It is considered one of the cap, uh, capitals of art in New Mexico. And I think that uh, if you ever come here, you will be thrilled with all the artwork that you, that you will see, not only Navajo, Hispanic work, but um, others have come in, uh, the uh, native, community, native community and so on. And so we have so much, so much, so many resources here that we would like to, I would like to see people um, see what we have. Thank you so much, Pauline, for your work, for bringing people together, even when we are apart. Last year was such a difficult year, but we're getting through it. You're also one of the reasons why we're here. Would you like to tell everyone at home about our special guest today? I sure would. Uh, Julia Gomez is a person that, I think you would all like to meet. She is only five feet tall, but she is so wonderful. And she has such beautiful work to share with not only New Mexico, but in Santa Fe, but also throughout the world. I know that Julia has been in many places and she is an ambassador for New Mexico. So um, Julia Gomez and I um, met through another organization called the New Mexico uh, Retired Educators. And um, after that, since I was in AARP, I had started this program and I thought, well, who sh I should have Julia on the program, of course. So when we talked about it, we came up with a title. We decided that we would really emphasize her embroidery work that she does called Colcha Embroidery. And so we um, came up with the title, Preserving an Art Form, Colcha Embroidery by Julia Gomez. 
That's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. You take care of yourself and I hope I get to meet you in person sometime. Take care. Thank you. Adios. Adios. As a comedian, I know art is an outlet for all of us to connect with ourselves and with each other. Art inspires us, it makes us feel closer, and it's also a great way to celebrate our culture and our history. Now, I would love for you to meet a woman who is using her art to preserve heritage, one colcha at a time. Julia Gomez, how are you? Pleasure to meet you. I'm fine, thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I'm so excited to meet you. I mean, look at look at all this beautiful work you have behind you. I mean, it's just it, this is pieces that you've done. Can you can you tell them a little bit about what a colcha is and a colcha embroidery? Okay, I'm gonna start with you know, colcha means blanket, but mm -hmm. we're not doing blankets anymore. Colcha embroidery. Mm -hmm. Colcha is the adjective for the embroidery. It defines the stitch, which is a, a very easy stitch to do. But it, mm -hmm. it became culture embroidery because the women that started this, sometimes they didn't have any textile. So they, if, if a blanket got a hole in it, okay, or maybe a moth ate it, they right. would, instead of just mending it, they would uh, embroider a bird or a flower, uh, a oh, leaf, wow. an animal. So pretty soon it became a work of art. Mm -hmm. And so it's the stitch that we're trying to preserve, and it's called the colcha stitch. Really, in uh, stitch. in the art in the archives, they mm -hmm. didn't. Uh, people who people who speak Spanish don't know why we call it colcha because it's not a blanket. And, it's not uh, a blanket, right? Yeah, it was it was named by non-speaking non-Spanish speaking people, and mm. they when they started collecting it, they knew that the women uh, would mend little holes with this particular stitch. That's why it's called a culture stitch. That's, and uh, yeah. That's so cool. And, and, and all the colors, you just kind of go with whatever inspires you and kind of goes with the piece. I mean, I'm looking at the pieces right behind you. Some of them are, are a little more intricate, more, you know, complex designs. And the other ones are are, are very nice too, but they kind of have like a more simplistic, minimalistic kind of take on the, on the design, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it just depends on what I'm thinking about um, because the Spanish brought the religion. So okay. the, the women came along on the uh, Camino Real and they already knew how to embroider because they had learned, they embroidered in Spain for many years. Then they, mm -hmm. then the, some of the women came through Mexico and Mexico has a very rich em, embroid, embroidery history. Mm. When they got here on the frontier, they didn't have anything except the sheep that they brought. In 1598, they brought the Chudo sheep. And I did mm. send you pictures of the sheep, but mm -hmm. I'll show it to you here. Can you see the sheep? There it is for it people at home that don't know what they look like. That's wonderful. So, so let me ask you this, Julia. Em, em, embroidery is like a new chapter, right? That you started after 37 years as a home economics teacher. Like, yes, yes. Like, like I want to ask, what was your motivation, you know, behind taking the steps to learn something new? Well, because I was a and so teacher. like so different, right? Like, yeah, it is different. I um, I I've always sewn because I'm just a little bitty person, and <laughs> I always had to hem everything that I bought. So yeah, I learned to sew very young, and my mother also taught me to embroider. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then I taught home ec, so, you know, I taught embroidery, but I didn't know much about the culture embroidery that I learned from Monica Sosaya Halford, and so I took a class with her, and she encouraged mm -hmm. me to keep it up, but I was young, I had my baby, and then later on, I picked it up again, and I met um, Beatriz Sandoval from Las Vegas, New Mexico. And it was about the time that I was in, going to, um, to, to retire. And I only have one daughter. And at the same time, she was leaving to college. So she says, mom, you better find something to do. You better teach another year. <laughs> and so I picked up this, um, this art and I really got involved with it. And uh, it's like a second career. Yeah. And, and, and some of your pieces are just not works of art. I mean, they're so beautiful. They're, 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 
actually a tribute to the people you love, right? Could you yeah. share with us a little bit about the culture and brewery, how, how it became a way to show your affection, you know, as, as a parent, like you were saying, it's like, you know, your, your daughter was like, you better find something to do, but I'm sure you made a lot of pieces for your daughter, right? Well, I, uh, the one here behind me, my right shoulder, it's called uh -huh. um, Cantaron los Gris Señores, because you know that in New Mexico, the happy birthday song and, and the song that we always sing for every celebration is yeah. Los Mañanitas. And Mañanitas. In English, um, mm -hmm. it translates to, on the day you were born, all the flowers were born. And at mm -hmm. the baptismal font, the nightingale sang. Do you want to sing it, Jesus? Do you know the song? I, I, I know how to sing it along with people, but yeah, I definitely know. Estas son las mañanitas que cantaba el rey David. You know, so, so, so I know any, anything after that part, I'm like, I, I start humming because I'm like, oh, I forgot the words. <laughs> well, this, the second verse is beautiful. And it reminded me of my daughter because I had her late in life. So mm -hmm. what you see is the edging is our morning glories, which were my daddy's favorite flowers. Mm -hmm. It has, right now, you'll see the lilacs in the upper right. Right now, yeah. Santa, Santa Fe is ablaze with lilacs. We're known for the lilacs in May. Mm -hmm. There's the Rocky Mountain iris. The holly, in June, all the hollyhocks will bloom. And wow. so I have the hollyhocks. I, I have the uh, Rosa de Castilla that the Spanish uh -huh. named a little flower as they were riding through New Mexico. And it really isn't a rose, but it reminded them of the roses in Castile, Spain. So yeah. named Rosa de Castilla. And then in the middle is the baptismal font and the um, uh, nightingales are singing. So I did that one for her because, you know, she was going away to college and it was like mm -hmm. a connection for me. That's and so amazing. Like, yeah, like even my grandfather, like he would do like a like embroidery stuff. And, and he like he even went on to make me what's called a ceñidor. And it's what, you know, um, the people in his like uh, the people in his in his neighborhood, they would wear like a type of it was called a, a calzón, which was basically like a long white short, but they would tie it with the ceñidor, which was basically a belt that they would do it from um, like an embroidery technique that they would do. And, and my grandfather made one for me years ago as I went to church, like my mom had a manda, um, like a promise that she had made to the Virgin yes. Mary. And I went dressed as Juan Diego. Okay. So uh, the ceñidor is basically the red belt you see on Juan Diego and the calzón, you know, called calzón, it was the white attire that you see Juan, De Juan Diego using. So I still have photos and I still have what looks like a scarf, but it's actually like a, a belt that you would tie. And it was under the same technique. And I know it took my, my grandpa so long to make, and it's like one of my most prized possessions, which brings me to my next question. Can you tell us a little bit about the creative process? Like how long does it take from beginning to end to complete a, a, a colcha embroidery? I can tell you it takes forever because I, this is the wool from the sheep. I take the sheep, the, the wool, then I wash it. I let it dry. I have to card it. And um, that means I comb it out. I align the fibers and then I spin it with a spinning wheel. And actually the Spanish brought an instrument called the malacate, which is a, a, a stick with a, a thing on the bottom and you, it's called a malacate and you spin by hand. But you know the modern thing, the Cadillac is a spinning wheel. So I spin the wool, then I have a loom and I weave the background fabric, which is called savania. And after that's woven and I have a bunch of it that I just took off, I just took it off the weaving loom on Friday. So now I have to knot it, I have to wash it, I have to block it. And then I get to sit down and, and embroider. But before I embroider, I have to dye the colors that I need. These are the colors that I have dyed myself. The red is from the cochinilla. It's a, a, a cochineal insect that grows on the prickly pear. The yellow is from cota or Navajo tea or sun, like this bright, vibrant. 
it's from uh, marigolds. The blue is a trade item. The blue comes from indigo. It's a plant that grows, they cut it down, they let it ferment, and actually the leaves turn blue. Uh, green, you know what calipes are? Wild calipes? They, they grow by the acequia. Uh, the calipes, if you let them grow too long, they get, you know, you want to eat calipes when they're tender. But when they get too stocky, they get woody. So that's the time that you use them and you can get green. So I dye them and then I have to come up with an idea to embroider. And um, so uh, I do religious images because the art was started by the Spanish women that brought beauty with just a needle and thread. And they, they, did most, they, did, uh, they, you know, they didn't have any statues at that time. We didn't have prints of saints. So they would embroider a religious image and you'll see those in the background. But then as an artist, the, um, you, I have to pay for my booth. So I have to find something that people will, will buy. And I know a lady said to me, I'm so glad you do birds and flowers because I'm not religious. So I love birds. And um, so I do a lot of birds, I do animals. The one behind me, there's a bear and he has bear hair in, his, in, the th in thread. The wolf that you see in the corner has mm -hmm. wolf hair in the in the yarn because I have a friend that works at the wolf sanctuary in Socorro, and uh, she cleans she cleans out the um, the cages and she keeps the 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 fur and then I buy it from her and I and I comb it into my uh, wool from the sheep. That's got to be difficult. I got to ask. So it's like, by the time you're finished with them, it's like, I'm sure you have mixed feelings about saying goodbye to these wonderful pieces when you sell them. Is that hard for you? Yeah, especially now that I'm getting older. And uh, I, I think, oh, I shouldn't have sold those. But people wanted them. Some of them are in museums. And yes, I, but then what would I do with them? But yes, they, they have a lot of, they had a lot of work and they have my spirit because that yarn has been through my hands many, many, many times. How has the pandemic affected it? Like the pandemic has affected artists, I mean, across the board and I'm sure it's affected you. Like how has that affected like the new normal of like being face-to-face -face at art markets? You know, well, that's on hold have, for now. We, we didn't have the art market. We, you know, we, we've been closed down for a mm. year. And so there's no markets. And you know what? I'm a school teacher, so I live on my little chequecito, my little check from Social Security. And so I don't have to make a living at this art. But other people do. The artists are hurting. They want to, they want to sell. That's amazing. And, and I have to say that through your work, not only have you won multiple awards, but also the love and recognition from your students and mentees. Like what, what piece of advice would you share as a mentor? for all of us to emerge stronger together? Uh, well, I think look for a hobby that you enjoy and go for it because we, you know, when we always learn, every day we learn something new and keep trying, you know, because even when my kids failed at something, my students, I said, keep trying. That's why it's called learning. And nobody's perfect when you start off. Absolutely. And, and my final two questions are rapid fire for you. The first one is, what is your recommendation for others to feed their passion? Well, like I said, find something to do. Try something new. I'm, I want to improve my mind. So I want to take piano lessons. They say that if you do some musical instrument, that it kind of stirs up those dead brain cells. Mm -hmm. And so maybe next year, I can play a little tune for you. Oh, I'm gonna hit you up next year to see what <laughs> what, what song you've been working on. I love piano. I, I love me some piano. So I'll, I'll, I'll definitely hold you up to that. And a year from now, I'm like, what do you got? What do you got for me? And, and, and my final question is, what does it mean to live a fulfilling life? <laughs> to enjoy every day, to have a reason to get up. And uh, the reason I get up, I'm just glad that I'm awake because 
I was uh, telling the girls that this year I turned 80 years old. When I, was, was? <laughs> I started stretching and making sure that my fingers were working and my legs and my, and I said, thank you, God. Here I go, 80 years, watch out. Thank you so much, Julia. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining me today. I learned so much. You are truly an inspiration to all of us. Uh, keep doing your amazing work. I hope I am able to meet you face to face sometime and able to pick up one of your beautiful embroidery pieces. Hi, I'm Julia Gomez, and I'm going to give you my five tips for creativity. Number one, don't worry about having everything that you need before you start. You'll accumulate it as you go along. This is a very simple art with embroidery. You only need a needle and a thread and something to sew on. Remember, that's why it's called Colch Embroidery because the art was done on, on blankets that had a hole in them and they were mended with a little flower or a bird and pretty soon it became a work of art. And you know, rules are made to be tweaked. If you don't have green for a leaf, then use another color. Be creative. Three, there are topics and themes all over that might inspire your creativity. I, I used to take my mom to church. She was 90 years old, I was 70. And if I, I took out my, my checkbook just to, to write on, because I didn't have anything else to write on, but I wanted to remember a design that I'd seen in church. And so I would draw it and my mama would go, pay attention. I was 70, she was 90 and she's still poking. Number four, you're never too old to start a new project and keep going. It's all right to make mistakes. That's called learning. You're not gonna be perfect all the time. I retired at 62 and I got involved in this art and it's just like having another job. I've traveled all over the country and abroad. Most of all, have fun at whatever you do. Don't get stressed and pass on your art. Share, share your work, share your knowledge because if you've lived a long time, you have a lot of experience and a lot of good things to teach children. Thank you. Uh, that's it for us. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you guys next time. And make sure you visit aarp.org forward slash to find out more about what AARP is doing in your community. We'll see you next time. <laughs>